Welcome to Dig It, a real estate podcast by Hubble Realty Company. Good day. Matt Weller, Vice President of Development at Hubble Realty Company with me today. Ryan Hardesty, Principal and Managing Partner at CDA, Civil Design Advantage. Welcome, Ryan. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, what does principal mean? Uh, It just means that I'm one of the... um, the partners that make management decisions at, at the uh, engineering company. Okay. So a fancy word for partner. Got it. So civil design advantage. Civil, let's start there. Uh, big picture. What does civil mean? I'm, I'm familiar with civil lawsuits. I use civil wear when I eat. Uh, what, does, <laughs> what does civil mean? Yeah, so um, we're primarily civil engineer consultants. So civil engineering, think of that as um, – your, your site infrastructure for a project, um, water, sewer, roads, parking. Those sort of items are civil engineering okay. items, so that's what we primarily design. So horizontal and down. Yeah, correct. So essentially, think of it as from a building, everything from that building out to the property line and the street. That's, that's what we do. Great. Okay. So first, first question for you, true or false, you... We're on season seven of Duck Dynasty. That is false. Man. Okay. Well, that threw off my next four <laughs> questions. So I can already tell I'm going to be laughing through this entire episode. I'm so done. I'm just going to sit back and giggle. I'm, I'm out of jokes. So that's it. Yeah. So. I, I'm kind of a stand in. Yeah. You know? Okay. I'm a stunt double. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So today we wanted to kind of touch on entitlements. You know, there's some fancy words that get thrown around in our business and. Um, what they actually mean, you know, I don't even know if I know what, it, what things mean. So we're going to start with the word entitlement. Like what, that's what we engage you as a civil engineer to help with as we're taking, you know, a vacant lot, uh, farm ground somewhere to a point where we can put a building on it. So entitlements, what, is, what does that mean to you? Sure. So that's going to be all of the items and permits that you're going to need to take a piece of ground and get all the approvals to to develop it, to create uh, whatever your project may be. So think of it as all the approvals and things you need from HJs or authorities having jurisdiction for a project. So that HJs. could be HJs, yeah. Okay, so like the city. Cities, counties, okay. uh, state, federal government. It could be a, a multitude of things depending on um, what your site entails. Gotcha. So state, federal, local. Okay. So zoning is one. I think everybody's probably heard of the term zoning. You know, I know residential zoning and commercial zoning, but when I see, when I drive down the road and I see a notice of rezoning from something to something, it's never from from farm to multifamily. It's always some letters and some some verbiage that doesn't make sense to anybody. Mm-hmm. What are what are what are some examples of zoning? Sure. So a property could be zoned ag. It could be zoned single family residential, multifamily residential, different levels within multifamily residential, commercial, light industrial, industrial. So essentially, what that is going to do is kind of set the the basic groundwork and for for the land use. But just to back up for a second, when you look at an initial piece of ground, the first thing we look at is um, where is it located? Is that even annexed into a city, mm-hmm. is it is it within the county? Um, you know, as the central Iowa metro area grows, you know, a lot of the ground that comes in is ground in county that needs to be annexed into the city. So, essentially, there's a future land use plan out there that kind of dictates um, what that could come into the city as as a zoning type, and then ultimately it will get zoned once it's annexed into a city, and then from that, that's going to set all of your your land use and bulk regulations for the site. Excellent. Bulk regulations. There's another fancy term. Sure. Uh, Just think of that as as the requirements within the site for things like setback. So each zoning district... So that's how close you can be to something. Right. right? Okay. So you you may have um, requirements for front yard, rear yard, side yard... um, primary and secondary uh, accessory use. So let's just say, for example, um, we have a multifamily zoning. It says that, you know, front yard setback of 40 feet, a side yard of 
of 30 feet and a rear yard setback of 30 feet. So basically that's lying. That's, that's, that's putting the regulations to where you can place a building within mm. a, a property boundary. Uh, so that's what would limit me from putting my shed right on the fence line with my neighbor. Mm -hmm. okay. And certain zoning districts may not even have a setback requirement, you know, dense urban, um, certain places don't have a setback, but then you also have to look at, um, you know, other bulk regulation items like maximum density, building height, um, minimum building area. So, so that so, kind of puts some parameters around what you can do within that zoning. So it, it, exactly. put some guardrails on it, to limit what you can do. Right. Okay. So, all right. So back to the, the zoning, different types. Those are prescribed in city ordinances, right? So, you know, you mentioned multifamily, different levels of residential. You know, when you fall into an R1, for example, the code will say what R1 means, what it includes, what you can do. But say you want kind of a blend. You know, I think there's a, a fancy term, PUD, thrown out there. Um, kind of explain what that That's a type of zoning, right? Correct, yeah. So it's it, that, a PUD, we have plan un, unit development. And every city kind of has a, a little bit different process to do that, and they may call them something different. But essentially what a PUD is, a plan unit development, it is more of a, a form factor-based zoning that allows some flexibility. It, it could have areas identified within that PUD that has certain density requirements, certain bulk regulations, or it could be more form-based where it allows for, you know, a, a, you're kind of trying to set it up for a certain look or, or standard. So it's, it's kind of tailored to a specific project or site. It's not correct. this yeah. PUD zoning. It, it's, it's individual. It's created each time. Exactly. So with that, you're going to have some sort of site master plan that's going to lay out, you know, what is the different land uses within that PUD? It could be, you know, a, a certain um, area of, of your PUD is more mixed use uh, that would allow for some commercial and residential products, or it could be a smaller PUD that would just essentially be residential projects only, and it would it would lay out um, all the all the requirements. And a lot of times those will reference back to like an R3 or an R2 multifamily. It's kind of the baseline zoning underneath it. Okay. All right. I think we've covered enough on zoning that, you know, I know enough to be dangerous. So let's go into like site plan approval. There's platting, preliminary, final, you know, it, it just seems like there's never ending steps on, on going from vacant ground to me being able to put something on it. So um, from the site plan standpoint, we talk a lot about stormwater and, you know, what we need to do to manage stormwater and what capacity we need. Is there other considerations like what, and I know you, you have, you've talked to me for an hour straight about stormwater, so we don't have time for all that, but, you know, high level, you know, what does, what does the public not understand about, um, you know, managing stormwater? Like, you know, you don't have to manage stormwater when you add a shed in your backyard. But if you put a, an apartment building or a retail building, there's a heavy burden there. So, like, what, what does that mean? Sure. So, once we, we have the zoning in place for a site, then the next thing we're going to look at is, what is this parcel of land? Is this parcel of land a, an outlot that's been previously platted as, as, an, as a future development lot, but it's not fully platted as a development parcel? Is it um, just a standard quarter, quarter, 40 acre section that's never been platted? Or is it a platted lot that uh, doesn't need to go through the platting process? That's all going to factor into some of the, the, the requirements and permits that you need down the road like stormwater. So let's just say we've identified a piece of land. Uh, it has the correct zoning and it, it's an unplatted parcel of, of land. So then what we would do is we'd start with the preliminary plat phase. Preliminary plat phase, um, it, that's where your stormwater and all those other items are going to come in. So the preliminary plat's going to lay out parcel boundaries, um, easements right away that would be dedicated to a city, parkland that would be dedicated to a city, a multitude of items. But basically, it's a planning document that you will submit to the city and they're going to look at that planning document and they're going to identify is, is all the things in this proposed development uh, lining up with the code, with the zoning code. And then we'll, we'll lay out that, you know, early 
stormwater management engineering portion of that to control the runoff from the site. So essentially there are stormwater regulations at state and, and city level that, that come into play that the site has to adhere to. Okay. So I, I recall seeing a stormwater analysis calc. There's engineering behind determining. Do I recall correctly that was like 80 pages or 100 pages of calcs? Absolutely, yeah. Your, your standard stormwater management plan is going to be in that, that 80 to 200 page realm. And basically what we're looking at is we're analyzing the, the current conditions of a site to understand what the existing runoff is off of that, that piece of ground. Is there off-site contributing flow? We input all those data points into a model. That model will output a essentially an allowable release that when you develop a piece of ground, you have to keep it back to that allowable release rate because you, you don't want to cause any negative downstream impacts with, with stormwater management. So once you analyze that existing site, you will set your allowable release rates, and then you will design your, your post-construction stormwater management facility to adhere to those allowable release rates. So we look at that all up front with a preliminary plat process, and we also look at the setbacks, we'll, we'll determine all those with that preliminary plat, make sure everything's shown on there appropriately, make sure everything fits. And then we'll take that preliminary plat into the final plat stage. The final plat is the actual document that's going to get recorded at the county. So it's going to be approved by Planning and Zoning and City Council. It will uh, create the parcels of land that were will be developed, whether it's a single or, or multiple parcels. It's going to dedicate with street parcels lots. meaning like lots properties yeah okay properties so we may have a piece of ground that's 80 acres and we may create that into 20 smaller parcels or one acre single family lots or, or whatever we're doing with that particular zoning that's that's the process that we're, we're splitting up those parcels of ground or combining them sometimes we may be in a in a downtown setting where we have small five small existing parcels We'll go ahead and we'll plat those into one development lot, combine them into one. So if you're splitting or, or combining parcels, that's going to go through your preliminary plat, final plat process. So you're actually doing work at each of these stages. So yep. I didn't know if you were just, you know, this is how we bill you. But you actually do <laughs> things. Okay. Right. Good to clarify. Right. No, so it's, you, a, it's a complicated process. And, you know, I've been doing this for 17 years. And every city is a little bit different in the metro area. And it's... The, the process is becoming more complicated over time. I know things are more complicated now. There's, there's more stringent requirements than, than there is. So there, there's a lot to the, the process. So a 200 page stormwater plan. Have you actually read one of those? Well, I write them. So, <laughs> I mean, no, you, you, there's a lot in there. I mean, I would say, you know, 80% of those calculations, they're all hydrographs that are developed by computer computer models within okay. there. And, and, and typically when you're reviewing one of those, um, so for like an upstream offsite contributing drainage area that may have, you know, runoff coming into your site, you would look at their model and you'd only be pulling out, you know, a certain amount of data from that. But it's, there's, there's a lot in there. It's, it's probably one of the more complicated calculations and parts of, of the development process as, as far as the engineering side goes. Okay. I think I'm I'm confused now, but you've done a great job of explaining. So, something I want to ask about: you hear you hear this term thrown around, NIMBYism or NIMBY. What does that mean? Uh, NIMBY would be not in my backyard. So N I M B Y. Correct. NIMBY. Okay, you got that. I got that. Okay. Move your mic a little closer too. There you go. So, so basically, whenever you're developing anything on a project, you're always going to have neighbors, and, and they may have different expectations for what they would mm -hmm. like to see the parcel developed as. I mean, typically in most situations, every new development, the neighbors would just like to see the land never be developed or just be, be a park. Well, that's really not going to be realistic. As you know, communities grow, there has to be growth and, and commercial and retail sites developed in order for there to be a, a convenience store, or there to be a, a apartments or, or single family or whatever the development may be, may be. So, and that's probably less of an issue here than in, you hear it about in, 
in California and some of the other more densely populated, but we've got a lot of farm ground. So um, I feel like a lot of where we develop, there's, there's not existing, you know, neighbors. We're kind of, we're, we're kind of going out and starting new. So. Yeah. For the most part, I mean, I would say maybe 15% of what we do is redevelopment work where it's, it's an existing site. It's um, the building might be getting knocked down or, or it's a vacant lot and we redevelopment. But yeah, for the most part in, in, you know, central Iowa, we're doing mostly new development of former ag land. Okay. So when we're going through and we're, we're entitling the land and getting a site work approved and preliminary plat and final plat and zoning, I mean, what are the checks and balances there? Where, where does the public have input or an ability to express their concerns? Where does, you know, the city council, the mayor, um, you know, what, what checkpoints do they have an opportunity to opine and say, hey, whoa, this isn't a good idea, or yes, we really support this, please move forward? Yeah, so, so basically it, it, each of the approvals that we've been talking about, those are all um, items that, that will typically be before city council and, and planning and zoning for public hearings. So starting with annexation and zoning of a property, that those are both going to be public hearings. There's going to be public notice. That allows people to evaluate what that proposal is for that piece of land, and then they'll um, be able to come to that public meeting and, and speak upon it. Okay. Same thing with preliminary plat, final plat. Um, typically, every jurisdiction is a little different, but they're going to go to a planning and zoning or a city council for approval. And kind of the last step in that process is the site plan. And that's where you're taking your detailed design and you're showing, you know, this is the exact building. This is the architectural components of the building. This is uh, the, the parking. So kind of goes all back to that zoning where there's a maximum density and what are the parking requirements. That's where you're showing at that site plan stage. You're showing we're building this exact building. It's this many stories tall. This is the, the architectural you know, building materials we're going to use to build it. This is what it's going to look like. We're, you know, proposing a certain amount of parking spaces. This is the landscape design. You know, all, all that goes into the detailed mm-hmm. stuff with the site plan, and those typically go between, go before a planning and zoning and a city council for, for approval. Okay. How long does that all take? Good question. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. Uh, it really depends on this jur- the jurisdiction. So, you know, I mean, what's the min and max? The, like two months to yeah, two like years, a rough, right? Yeah, like a rough estimate range. I mean, something like that. So let's just start with the minimum. So if you have a a community that allows you to concurrently get all of your approvals, you could basically go in, zone a property, do your preliminary final plat and site plan, submit everything at one time, and then everything would be reviewed concurrently. You're probably looking at best case scenario, I would say 16 weeks, four months, best, you, best case. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Doing that math. Mm-hmm. If you, if you, if you had a site that's more complicated, a bigger, a bigger master plan, maybe it's a plan unit development, something that's going to take um, a, some additional planning steps, you're, you're probably looking at six months plus to, mm-hmm. to go through that process. So it's, the, my understanding is there's, and I know it varies by jurisdiction, there's no clear cut step one, two, three, but uh, it's not just one reading at city council. It can be two or three, which occur every, you know, two weeks, twice a month. So you might have a month and a half just to get through city council plus the submittal. I mean, it, it adds up pretty quick. It does. Yeah. I mean, just high level. If, if you came to me and said, I've got this new piece of ground, I'm going to go through the process to develop it is whatever. I'm going to tell you, we better plan on four to six months up front at a minimum. It could be longer depending on what the characteristics are of that existing parcel. If it's already a plotted lot, some of those steps may be already completed and then we can kind of, you know, jump a little further ahead in the development process. But it just depends on on, on what that particular piece of ground is. That's why due diligence in looking at the property up front is, is very important. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned something earlier, future land use plan. That's something I wanted to touch on. So that my understanding is that's a non-binding, 
it's not zoning. It doesn't zone certain properties, but it kind of identifies, you know, what the intended use is, what the city's intended use of that land is. And, and that might help when you go to zone in the future, it might help indicate, hey, this was, this was part of our vision uh, and we're going to continue to allow the zoning there despite potential opposition um, at the time. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. So your future land use plan is for areas that are, that are unzoned within a municipality. It's going to kind of outline what the, the city's plan or intent was for that piece of land. So it could be an industrial area. It could be commercial. It could be residential. It could be open space or park. So essentially every municipality is going to have some sort of future land use plan or a county may have a future land use plan that kind of outlines as they look at things from a, from a regional level, you know, what, what do they want located at certain areas within their community? Okay. I just, I think something that always comes up is people say, Oh, I haven't drove past here for you know, a, a six months or a year. And they're like, oh, it just, everything goes by, you know, gets built so fast. Yeah. It's like, it, they don't think about all of the different components that go into it just to even get it ready yes. to go vertical. And, and some, some projects are more challenging than others. I mean, we've, we've had some, um, my daughter's five and a half, and we've, we've had a couple projects turn over here that I started when I had no kids, right? I mean, they can take a long time. Once they actually start constructing, it's a, it's a defined timeline. But usually it's kind of like an iceberg. There's a whole other section that happened before that that you don't know anything about that took longer than that actual construction period. That was I was going to bring up a project. I didn't know if you guys can touch on it briefly, but I think Gray Station is a really good example of a PUD, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and probably one that's really complicated when it comes down to the the runoff and the stormwater and and then just the overall kind of master plan concept. I don't know if that's worth going into. And I mean, again, the podcast is not an hour long, so yeah. <laughs> That one gets pretty complicated, and it and so that Claire brought up an example of, of Gray Station, which is a larger non-project. It's a larger project, so it's it's more intensive land development um, that has maybe twenty different projects within it, and so that PUD was was blanketed over the entire property with general intended uses for each parcel. And as we move along, things change. Things change in the last five years and will change in the next five years. So, But it established the groundwork for what are we intending to do and in, in getting support, um, and it helps the process as we move along. Yeah, I remember when I started looking at Gray Station in 2015, and then we started our initial PUD zoning uh, in 2016. It, that, that project is just huge. It's it, the, the stormwater management facilities alone um, basically take 400 acres of downtown Des Moines and, and they put it into a regional detention base. And um, that, I mean, the design of that took eight months. Uh, construction of that took almost two years. That, that project is one of the ones, it's, it's so much more complicated than if you had like a three-acre piece of ground that you were wanting to build a convenience store or you were wanting to build a, a multifamily, you know, couple townhome units. But... It's, it's fun. I, I know when we started Gray Station, um, you know, I th think they said, oh, you'll be working on this one for, you know, 15 years. And, well, that was, that was eight years ago, and we're still working on it. And it's just such a giant development right in the, you know, right in the heart of downtown. Yep. It's an exciting project. It's good. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? Right. Well, Claire, do we want to jump into our our Oh, you're ready for off the rails. All yeah. right. I'm ready too. So again, off the rails is a random question generator. That's kind of how we wrap up each of these podcasts. So um, are you ready? Is it coming to me? It's coming. Well, it's coming at both of you. So okay. whoever feels... Yeah. We have a buzzer here. Whoever feels the <laughs> urge to answer first. The off the rails question is, what are you a natural at? So you kind of have to give yourself a pat on the back. At, Can I ways. answer for Ryan? And then Ryan answers for you, and then you answer for – we can – sure. Let's try that. Let's, let's do that. Let's try it. That'll be interesting. So Ryan Ryan is a very fascinating individual in, in what his hobbies are. And, and you correct me when I'm wrong here, but uh, he enjoys hunting. He's an outdoorsman. He's a, he's a, you know, a guy's guy. Check all those boxes. So he tells me the other day – not the other day. It's probably a year ago now – that he's drying some Osage orange tree stumps in the t 
timbers of his outbuilding and been reading a book on on Flint. Um, basically, tr- he's long story short, he's trying to create make his own bow out of the the tree stump I mentioned. Get his own arrowheads from Flint Rock and make his own string for the bow so he can hunt with literally everything that he made with his own hands. Is that accurate? That, that's accurate. That is, that's the long-term goal. That's start, start from scratch and, and go out and get a, get a giant Iowa buck with it. Yeah. Where are you at on that pro, pro, project? So I, I've got the trees cut down, got them dried, split and started the process of, of making the bow, uh, it, which there's more in, more that goes into it than that. Um, I started shooting recurve bow a few years ago to kind of start to learn the process of it. So that's that's an ultimate goal. This is a lifelong project, yeah. right? Some I've always wanted to do. Yeah. You know, amazing. outdoor camping, yeah, like all those things. He also, you know, he, he makes his own hot sauce. His garden is superior to mine. He just has all these all these hobbies that it, they're inspiring. So. Now Matt's got a lot of hobbies too. I mean, he's got he's got the whole beekeeping thing going on that I I'd like to kind of get into that. I just don't know all the specifics. A little intimidated by it. There's kind of a lot more that goes into it than you would really, which would, that you would really think about. I'm not an expert, but I try. So okay, now that you answered the question for each other, mm. do you want an answer for yourselves or not? You're gonna have to ask the question again. I don't. Remember. What are you a natural at, mm. Matt? Or Ryan? I, I just in general, I I'm probably a natural at 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 speaking and talking and and just more or less, you know, getting in front of city council. Doing, and, yeah, I mean, I I would say on the engineering side, um, sometimes it's hard to find engineers that can get up in front of a city council and talk. And I've always been one that I can I can just get up and talk and you know tell stories. So good. He's prob- a, probably he's a likable person. Help so. him understand yep. a little bit yeah. of vision and all that. Yeah. Natural at um, tinkering, figuring things out. Something's broken, figure out how to fix it. Um, and now with, with YouTube and internet, it's a lot easier. But I mean, I remember in high school taking apart my car and figuring out how to install a, a car alarm or what, just, just figuring things out. That's, that's what I'm a natural at. You should have went into engineering. I did. I, I well, was electrical I, engineering, and then I switched over to construction engineering because I liked, I liked building things. Yeah, I think you'd be really good at the design aspect of, of. It sounds it sounds boring. Yeah, it's not boring. Not boring. All right, is that is that fair? awesome? Yeah, that's it. If you guys any other topics you want to touch on, at all? No. Claire, what's what's it. you don't get to answer the the toss up question. How about you? What are you a natural? natural? Yeah. Uh, oh, I yeah, I I've got the gift of the gab. That's mm. that's pretty accurate on my end. We can probably leave it at that. But so Claire yeah. also raises. She lives out on a farm. I won't say where. I do share that, but raises chickens. Your parents mm-hmm. beekeep, I believe. They do. They do, and I have my three gardens going this year. Yeah. Two of three are underway, so we're gonna have to trade. Some hot sauce recipes right. or some some gardening Do recipes. Some gardening. Yeah, I think right. we can Absolutely. all make it happen between hot sauce and honey and gardening. I think we're in a pretty good spot. Sounds good. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for coming on Dig It the, today. And again, if you haven't uh, rate, review, subscribe, you can get Dig It uh, Real Estate Podcast wherever you get your podcasts: Apple, Spotify, Google, you name it. We also have a YouTube channel. So thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Ryan. No Appreciate problem. It. Thanks for inviting me.